It's been almost 2,000 years since Paul the Apostle went before King Agrippa to give an account of his ministry roughly two-thirds of the way through his life. We read in the book of Acts, chapter 26, and verse 20, he said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Now you will notice that this is basically the message of John the Baptist. Now if you were to read through the book of Romans, you would never get the impression that Paul preached repentance everywhere he went. But I want you to notice this verse that is frequently overlooked or completely skipped over altogether in preaching. He said, I declared first to those in Damascus. You will recall that it was at Damascus that Jesus met Paul on the road. It was there that he was knocked off of his horse, as it were, and saw the great vision. But beginning at that point in his life, from the first moments, as it were, that he was truly born again and changed and called to be the minister that he was, he began from that point to preach repentance. And he preached it at Damascus, then at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. This was Paul's message that he preached. It's important that we understand that, because it is so frequently, again, overlooked. Paul the Apostle was a repentance-type preacher. It is impossible for people to truly come to faith in Jesus Christ unless they have gone through the process of repentance, as is described to us through the teachings, of particularly of John the Baptist. In order to understand why Paul the Apostle preached basically John the Baptist's message everywhere he went, beginning at Damascus all the way to the Gentiles, we need to understand something about John the Baptist and his ministry. Understand that a king was coming into the earth. That king was Jesus Christ. However, that king did not come in his first coming, or as is commonly known, in his first advent to set up an earthly kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom in the hearts of men. Therefore, the message of John the Baptist has absolutely nothing to do with the establishment of an earthly kingdom. It has everything to do with establishing a kingdom in the hearts of men. In Acts 26, 21, Paul then goes on to tell us exactly why the Jews were so upset and hostile at him. He says these words, For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. You see, a lot of times we think that Paul was being persecuted of the Jews because he was trying to throw off certain of their teachings and things of that nature, and this is true. But we must also keep our minds on the fact that it was the preaching of repentance that caused the Jews to want to kill Paul. In fact, they tried to kill him. Just like Jesus, who was ultimately crucified, and just like John the Baptist, who they brought his head on a charger. The word of repentance is not popular today. It has never been popular, and it never will be popular. John the Baptist was not just an ordinary preacher. He was the type of man that when he preached, he expected the people to do exactly what he was saying, because he spoke on behalf of God. We read in Matthew 3, verses 5 through 6, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region round the Jordan went out to him, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. You see, John brings the people back to the Jordan as God had done through Joshua hundreds of years before. 
It is here that they kept on confessing their sins before God. We learn in 1 John 1 and 9 that confession of sin is required for forgiveness, albeit confession alone is not enough. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Luke 3, verse 7 and 8. You see, John demands proof from these men and women of the new life before he will administer baptism to them. The fruit is not the change of heart, but the acts which result from it. Notice what the people said. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. He that has food, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than what is appointed you. The soldiers likewise demanded him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Luke 3, verse 10 to 14. You see the word repentance or metanoia, means a change of mind which issues in regret and a change in conduct. Sorrow is not, as is popularly conceived, the primary nor the prominent notion of the word metanoia. You see, Paul distinguishes between sorrow and repentance, and he puts the one as the outcome of the other. In other words, Second Corinthians 7 verse 10, godly sorrow worketh repentance, or godly sorrow works a change of mind that doesn't later change back. In Acts chapter 19, Paul the Apostle arrived at Ephesus and he found certain disciples. And I want you to notice what he asked them. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard that there be any Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. You see, the church at Ephesus began with a John the Baptist type message. They had repented of their sins, they had confessed their sins, and they had been baptized in water. Now notice what Paul says. He said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. And when they heard these words, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, Paul was making sure that the foundation, as it were, had been laid in their spiritual life. He made sure that they had truly repented and brought forth fruits worthy of repentance so that they could then be in position to receive the Holy Spirit. You'll remember that John the Baptist's message in his ministry, in fact, was to make straight the way of the Lord. When you look at that word straight in the Greek, it means to get, basically, to get the people's heart right with God. That's what we learned from the book of Acts chapter 8. You see, Simon the sorcerer in that chapter, his heart was not right towards God. And it's the same Greek word as make his paths straight. Right and straight are the same Greek words. So what does that mean? It means that the objective of the minister in preaching the gospel is to turn the people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And essential to that process is the preaching of repentance. Until a person truly gets their heart right with God, they're not in a position to receive the Holy Spirit. That's the reality of it. A few years later, Paul is getting ready to leave Ephesus, and he reminds the leaders at Ephesus exactly what he had been preaching. 
we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 20. He said, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God, and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, Paul was getting ready to leave the church at Ephesus. But before he left, he reminded them of a very sobering truth. He said these words, Acts 20 verse 26, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now you will notice that he makes a reference to the book of Ezekiel chapter 3 when he says, I am innocent to the blood of all men. You see, God gave the prophet instruction that he was to warn the people. He was a watchman over Israel. And so long as he warned the ones that were in sin, he was clear from their blood. But if not, God would require their blood at his hand. So we need to understand the context of what Paul is saying here. He's making a reference back to the Old Testament prophets. A concept that the Jews and even many of the Gentiles would have understood because of the teachings that Paul would have given them. They would have known what he meant. He said, I preached to you till I was clear of the blood of all of you. Meaning that I told you directly to turn from your sin, to turn to God, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, be baptized in water, and receive the Holy Spirit. See, this is Paul's message. He didn't shun to declare to them the entire gospel. And because of that, he could look them in the eye and say, I'm free from the blood of all men. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, we read, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds upon it. Now you will remember that at Corinth it was said, Paul planted, Apollos watered. So in a similar figure, Paul is talking about building, like building a structure. In this case, building the church, or that church in particular. He said, I laid the foundation, that foundation was Jesus Christ. But for those who came after me, let them take heed how they build upon it. Now, the word master builder or wise master builder in the Greek is architecton. Tecton just basically means carpenter. It means stonemason or woodworker. Arche being like the highest one. We get our word archangel or archbishop from the same prefix. So Paul is saying... I was the wise master builder, I laid the foundation, and let everyone that builds on that foundation take heed how they build upon it. Paul the Apostle was very concerned about how the church was going to be built when he left. He told us very clearly, take heed how you build thereupon. You'll notice that he said Jesus Christ was the foundation. We can think of it in the terms of a person. We know in other places that Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone and that we are living stones built together to be a holy habitation of God by the Spirit. But there is a process that the stones, if you will, have to go through in order to be placed in the temple. There's a word in the Hebrew that talks about a stone being a shalom stone. The word shalom meaning wholeness. God wants to bring us to a place of wholeness. What does that mean? It means that he wants us to completely turn away from our sin, to get our heart right with him. We can be baptized in water even according to his word, and then his desire is that we would receive the Holy Spirit. Again, this was the question that Paul asked. Did you receive when you believe? 
when they received, they became living stones that could be set in the temple. In other words, they were able to be placed into the temple project of which at Corinth, he was the architecton or the wise master builder. This memorial is dedicated to honoring and remembering the 114 people who lost their lives and over 200 others who were injured by the tragic events of July 17, 1981, and to recognize and honor the emergency and medical personnel, firefighters, police officers, public servants, and others who so bravely responded to this unprecedented disaster in our city. I will never forget that Friday evening, July 17, 1981, when the family was sitting around watching television only to have the broadcast interrupted with a special report that some emergency had happened in downtown Kansas City. A tea dance party had been rolling at the Hyatt Regency Hotel, arguably the city's poshest hotel, with 1,600 people in attendance. News began to stream in that something very terrible had happened. Two connected concrete and steel walkways collapsed and plunged to the ground under the weight of those standing on them. These massive multi-ton structures fell to the lobby that was hosting the tea dance, killing 114 people and injuring 216 others. It was the deadliest construction-related disaster to date and would not be surpassed until the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center in 2001. It was not an act of war, it was an act of negligence. The concrete and steel fell, killing many instantly. Others were given morphine and told they were going to die. The scene was so horrific that it resembled a war zone. Again, this wasn't caused by enemies prevailing and terrorism causing a terrible catastrophe such as this, but a derelict building modification that was never properly reviewed to determine the consequences of such a design change. This is the memorial where the names of those 114 victims are listed one by one on the front and the back. The Hyatt Skywalk collapse of 1981 caused more loss of life and injuries than any construction related accident in American history up until that date. It has only now been surpassed by the collapse of the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. The Hyatt Skywalk collapse is commonly cited by engineering ethics instructors on what an unqualified modification can do in terms of loss of life. When a change is made and it's not truly qualified, it puts people's lives at risk. So I have to ask a question. What happens when people over the centuries have made what we might call unqualified changes to the gospel? Unqualified adjustments to how we win people to Christ or see them come to the Lord. Paul claimed himself to be a wise master builder. But what do we put at risk when we make our unqualified changes? I suggest to you that we don't just put lives at risk, 
we put souls at risk. Jesus told the disciples, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The only way the church is ever going to be the light that God intended for it to be is that individuals be born again of the Holy Spirit to receive a new heart and a new spirit to become the lights that God intended them to be. It doesn't take a rocket engineer to see that darkness is pervading in the land and the only hope that we have is for people to truly be born again. Sadly, for the last 100 years, we have seen a systematic de-emphasis of new birth. You go back to the days of Billy Sunday, he told the people, we want you to be able to get saved without all the fuss. And as a consequence of that, we have had a hundred years of a slow deterioration of evangelism. We went through a period of about 70 years where people would say the sinner's prayer in order to get saved. But today, if you simply just start going to church, and if you'll attend regularly, people will assume, in many cases, that you're saved. You don't even have to go to an old-fashioned altar. Truly repent of your sins and truly trust Christ. You don't have to be baptized in water in many cases, and far be it from many ministers to even bring up the topic of receiving the Holy Spirit. But we have to bring the gospel to people in a way that God ordained for it to be. We are building a church alongside of Christ. We are His husbandry. We are His building, but we are also fellow workers with Him. And it's important that we recognize this. In this video series that I've entitled Televangelicalism based upon the book, I want to describe and explain how for the last 100 years we have watched a systematic de-emphasis of new birth. I want to go back all the way to the book of Acts and trace evangelism from Acts until modern times. You'll want to stay tuned.